I, this is by far the hardest thing I've ever done. I've always tried to to kind of add another step, you know, so like something that I've is new to me for every record, you know, challenge myself in some way and add some a little step to the tool toolbox, you know. For me, this was like adding 10 steps. So I am here with the masterful Isan. Uh, how are you, my friend? I'm very good. Thank you. And you? Yeah, not too bad. Um, as we were saying, you know, just the thawing out from the, the freezing temperatures that we're experiencing. Well, I mean, that's, you know, the perfect segue to uh, what is perhaps the coldest album we'll hear uh, for next year, which is, you know, your self-titled record. So, um, you know, for those who may not necessarily be familiar with the record, it's a companion style album and features two very different musical performances. But what made you want to explore music in this particular way for this record? No, it was, um, I think it's been a while since my last full length record, you know, and I've been doing some EPs and going in very much in one direction, very much in the other direction. And uh, during the pandemic, I got to do some producing, you know, I got a chance to reset. I thought I'd kind of revisit, um, what I believe might be some of the core elements of what I've been doing, you know, since the beginning of my career, which is kind of taking my my love for extreme metal music and blending it with my love for soundtracks and uh, and orchestral music. Uh, so I de- I decided before I even started the writing any music that I want to be doing a fully conceptual album, uh, that I wanted to write the music and do the arrangements in such a way that they, you know, the orchestral parts and the metal parts would work independently as well as together. So it's not, you know, it's not entirely two different things. It's just the same music um, where the metal album incorporates it or, or, or incorporates all the, all the orchestral elements as well, but they are written in a way so that they also should function, you know, independently how did you kind of um you know choose the i guess the kind of melodies that would be the constant for both sides of each of the works yeah uh, i basically wrote all the music just as a piano short score you know just wrote all the bass lines all the chordal passages all the melody lines all the counterpoints you know just as a piano short score and then literally just arranged it for you know guitars bass and and all that and the same music for for the orchestra instead of trying to fit two large things into the same you know the the, the audio spectrum is only that <laughs> that big you know so so you so um um and also to to try and explore uh, kind of more dynamic and emotional ranges within the same music like the first single that is out now you know pilgrimage oblivion which is arguably probably the most heavy and fast uh, track on the album and it starts off really really extreme but if you listen to the the orchestral counterpart to that uh, which is essentially the same music it starts off with just very almost whispering quiet tremolo stellos you know so it's a it's the same music but it's a different tension to it Okay, and so you mentioned that there's a there's a concept sort of at play here, and um, you know, for, forgive me if I've completely read this wrong, but the the way because I know that service venator means like deer hunter or stag hunter, if that's correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought you know with the sort of um, the allusions to Promethean uh, spark and the taste of ambrosia, it feels like it's almost like a, a fall from grace kind of thing. Is that have I got that completely wrong or? No, but it, that's quite, uh, what, what can I say? The, I kind of wrote like a synopsis for a novel as, as a background for, you know, the writing the lyrics to, you know, and, and create this kind of uh, um, very very traditional storyline, you know, like John Campbell, Hero's Journey, our, our protagonist being exposed to something um, unexpected, you know, goes on the journey and... Uh, are um, comes comes back changed the core elements are really really basic and old school in a way you know the traditional 
extreme metal band lineup and it all the orchestral parts are just you know again unnecessarily complicated for for someone like me probably but i i uh, you know made out a template for full symphony orchestra and you know wrote all the parts there's no no patches like that so it's, i wrote it so that it could literally be played by real orchestra as is and uh, so so a traditional symphony orchestra traditional band traditional storyline and for for the orchestral version kind of follows a separate storyline which is an old folk tale that kind of bleeds into the main story it's uh, but it's i'm kind of reluctant to 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 go too much in depth of uh, what the story is about because i think it will be self explanatory to some extent when the lyrics and everything um you know come together and the music videos that will follow these two different versions and everything uh, but it's more important for me and this is just from a fan perspective that it's more, more important for me that people experience you know their own interpretation of whatever is there my story is not really that important the, the most important part is that uh, you know you feel the story and fortunately I, I think to some extent I might have succeeded as also before this album was you know you know, starting to get released. I I played it to some friends and colleagues, you know, when it was all done, but they had no idea about it being a concept or anything. And they, a lot of them came back to me and said, like, this feel, it feels like I'm watching a movie. Yeah. Which was like, mission accomplished. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not saying that's it for everyone, but uh, I think it, it's just from, from the kind of albums I grew up on, you know, with Our Maiden and Judas Priest and King Diamond, you know, where you, you look at the artwork and uh, you listen to the music and it it kind of makes sense mm-hmm. you know and uh, you know I, I kind of want to delve a little bit more into the the symbolism of the stag i've found that there's quite a lot of different meanings behind the stag you know it, it's been used i think in so many traditions mm-hmm. you know but for, for me i the main thing i i, I associate with the stag is go is of course the natural aspect you know the the purity of the uh, of natural, but also uh, with the antlers. You know uh, the the expansion of the mind. Well, absolutely, and and also because you know it's that regenerative thing, isn't it? Because they do shed the yeah. Wow. You're onto you're onto something there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because I, I was trying to sort of like delve into how you know the the sort of stag coalesces with music and things like that, and um, a name that came up was Bella Bartok um, as well for like you know that sort of symbolism. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of slowly kind of getting into that. Are you are you familiar with Bartok? Is is that correct? Oh yes, oh yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 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 you're definitely onto something there, and and um, which is the good thing, you know, you know. I present you know the, these small things, you know, and I had my reasons for doing that, and you might, you know, pick up on that and f- follow some some threads of your own, and it might make you think and make up your have your own experience of everything and and that's why i'm not trying to be secretive or anything it's just like it you know flat out to explain everything but then i've so often had maybe some of my own experiences with music a bit not destroyed you know but but tampered with because you know for on the sideline i got maybe the artist's original you know thoughts and everything kind of imposed on me in a sense and it was so far off from what i did experience and i'd rather not know no i I totally agree and then you know like like I had that sort of interpretation of the fall from grace and all that sort of stuff. And then you can build up so many different other interpretations of what is a, you know, a work. And I think it, it really stems from that, that traditional element that you mentioned, you know, I, I, mm. I was familiar with the, the fact that you can only concentrate on three things at, at a certain time. So it's, it's really, really fascinating. Yeah. But I think and uh, it's often, it's often associated, I think extreme uh, music and, or or classical music or operas and I think it is kind of associated with with being something um, kind of 
uh, hard to penetrate. You know, it's too complex and it's too kind of uh, highbrow or uh, what have you. But it's it's just music, you know. And um, and I and I think I I learned this kind of the hard way myself because we tend to intellectualize and and kind of uh, and you may read poetry and like I I don't get it. You know, I, I don't understand it. And it's like you're supposed to crack a code or something. Yeah. But, you know, over the years, I found that it's nothing to do with that. It just, does it resonate with me? Does it mean anything to me? You know, does it make me think and feel and, and have a good experience? That's all that matters. Art, in, in many ways, is the stuff that communicates the stuff that we don't have words for, you know? You know, it, it, there's tragedy. And, it, it, and even when you're young, you may, may not have had tragedy in your life, but but listening to music and, and getting these or if it's from movies or poetry or or literature you can you can even it can almost prepare you for that kind of you know sensation because we will all have that you know absolutely and it it changes you know from your different experiences within life as well right yeah for sure and and even music can change you know in part of your life a piece of music can have one meaning and then maybe you revisit it and you're in some all the part of your life and and it makes meaning in a new way absolutely is is that kind of one of the reasons that you decided to have it as a as a self-titled record you know it's very much kind of a a statement of this is who the artist is and that sort of distillation no nah, not, not really i, I think uh, people have made a kind of a big point that it is such a, a big bold statement to have a self-titled album it was just like it was so many layers to it and I found it hard to find a title that could kind of combine, uh, you know, or circle it all, the whole thing. And uh, at the same time, I felt it was, you know, if I was going to do a, do a self-titled album, which is kind of tradition, a tradition for some in some sense, I, I guess, yeah. when you've been been doing so for a while. And this is, I felt this is very with you know, the extreme metal stuff and the orchestral bits and conceptual things and also the thematics I, I deal with. It, it felt very much, you know, down the middle of what I've been doing, you know. So it's it felt very core, core, my style of writing. One of the things I have been really, really fascinated with is all the different sort of breadcrumbs that I could hear from like Holst to uh, Bernard Herrmann, <laughs> and um neo morricone <laughs> things like that like do you do you have a particular favorite composer or is it kind of you just sort of pick and choose it's, it's that whole it's that whole, whole it's not even an era you know but hmm. but um of course it's uh, my introduction to to orchestral music was not classical music it was soundtracks you know and to this day you know jerry goldsmith's omen is probably my favorite soundtrack and um of course john williams and uh, but also of course Hans Zimmer, you know, and all the modern stuff as well. I love a lot of the the modern soundtracks as well. But of course, when you listen back, and I was just playing to my son earlier, you know, Gustav Holst, you know, with the, the planets Mars and everything, and it's like, aha, so John Williams. He was listening to, <laughs> you know, but I, I think probably a lot of people might mistake that for Star Wars, you know. So <laughs> so, um, and then you have all the textures, especially in in cinematic music from from that area you know with Stravinsky you know from, from um, you know uh, some of his music all the old embellishments and all these kind of more expressive sound textures and um, it all kind of goes backwards you know in time you, if you you follow bre breadcrumbs along as you said along the way and of course again I'm not reinventing any wheels here and that was not the point it was rather my fascination for that kind of expression, the tonal language, uh, you know, the 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 chordal uh, colors, you know, of that that music, that is uh, very non-typical guitar stuff. It's not very pentatonic, is it? So so uh, so I had kind of these small rules and dogmas for for different aspects of the of the music, but like I will have no uh, diatonic chord progressions on this album. You know, of course, there are the, the, the atomic chords uh, in between, but uh, but never like a full progression that kind of re resolves uh, 
in a in the traditional way. But I, I guess that sort of, in a way, that sort of um, self-imposing that challenge for yourself, it, you know, it's, it's quite freeing in another way, isn't it? Because you're you're doing something that's completely different to what maybe you have done before. Is is that correct? With yeah, you? yeah, absolutely. And but this is by far the hardest thing I've ever done. It was so, I mean, I've always tried to to kind of add another step, you know, so like something that I've it's new to me for every record, you know, challenge myself in some way and add some, a little step to the tool toolbox, you know. But if I'm quite quite honest, just again, subjectively as a non-scholared musician, self-thought, DIY, uh, for me, this was like adding 10 steps to that ladder, you know, so it was super educational. <laughs> but also at the same time, so gratifying, even though I had some regrets along the way because it's a it was a really huge bite uh, to to take on but uh, in the end i'm i'm yes so satisfied you know with having seen it through it's a it's a very very nice feeling to to have seen it through and also made me excited for you know at my age i'm closing in on 50 and i can still you know feel to have kind of creative growth you know expanding not not being set in any particular way you know that and that's my main objective for making these kind of uh, um all these conceptual frameworks for my work is really to make myself as excited about making a new album as back when i was 16 but yeah, I can imagine that there must have been a few points when you were like christ i've definitely bit off more than i can chew here <laughs> Yeah, it's just like, why couldn't I just go do what ACDC does, you know? <laughs> but it's, you know, you're, you're a very humble person, you know, like it's it's a, a huge achievement of what, what you've been able to do. And the fact that you learn all of this new material, you know, because you created, all, you mentioned it earlier on in the chat, like that you created all of the, the string arrangements. And was that like for, forgive me because I'm not quite sort of like well versed in how you know like logic and pro tools and all that sort of stuff works but were they actual instruments that you've that you've used they're not like no, it's pre predominantly samples oh. I've been working closer to Spitfire Audio which is a British company who make <laughs> amazing samples I have far too many sample libraries from them <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for the most part for this I, I used uh, uh, a library that uh, they uh, made that the BBC Symphony Orchestra Pro, which they, they literally sampled the BBC Symphony Orchestra in detail. You know, like every articulation. So, um, uh, and this was for for all the instruments. And you you program every individual part, and then you do that for violins too, viola, cello, basses. You know, then might, you might add some solo violins to do embellishments, and then you do the same for the brass section, for the woodwind section. For the percussion section, and then I had I had um, uh, a wonderful musician called Chris Baum uh, do uh, you know multiple layers of real violins for all the violins once and violin in two parts, you know. In addition to their, uh, you know, when I was recording the drum, we also did a lot of the live percussion on top. So there's like a hybrid of of sampled instruments and and really instruments. I've always been uh, kind of maximizing things. You know, I've had a tendency to just do too much, uh, but at the, at the same time, it's it's pro probably from you know being a dual dual band, the dual dual guitar bands, you know, mostly and you know listening to Priest and Maiden, you know, the dual guitar thing, mm -hmm. and I never saw the point of both guitar players in the band playing the same thing, you know. Why, 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 why wouldn't you just like use those resources like creatively? So, so, and then it, you come to a point where you just every new element, you know, you want to do something different. And I, I can listen back to you know some emperor stuff and where I, I just added layers and just just the stuff that you, you shouldn't do, you know, like having all these different melodies and it goes in all directions and 
and you just get lost in the chaos. So, so, um, but it, you know, there's time for that and and to to try and hone. Why, why didn't this work? You know, I was doing all the all the orchestral blah, like the impression you have, but then you when you boil it down, it's really just very neatly and very very clear. It's like with probably with painting, you know, yeah. that uh, that uh, you, you really need to know the shadows and the light, you know, where to put it to to make it just right. What would you say, um, you know, as you, we talked about a few composers, but is there a particular one that you kind of identify the most with? Like, is it James Horner or is it Jerry Goldsmith? Or I, I, I don't identify with any of them in a book. They are in, it's, it's a totally different league. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's just something entirely different. I, I've been, you know, humbly inspired by what they have done and tried to apply that into my world of music. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's very uh, not not comparable in, in that sense. So, but uh, I think J- Jerry Goldsmith, with his kind of um, kind of experimental twist on things, you know, and for Alien, and it's just something about his tonal world that is is very dark. Mm. And uh, but of course, also it's it's they're classics for for a reason, you know. Like uh, with John Williams being very romantic and fluent in in all his melody lines and all that, and and then Bernard Herrmann with his kind of more minimalist orchestras and and really uh, there's a coldness, you know, to how how his uh, arrangements work. And oftentimes I I've read that was because of uh, also limited budgets that he, he didn't have you know the budget for more musicians. Like for for Psycho, he he didn't uh, he only had a budget for strings. <laughs> Way from from what I can recall, maybe I'm mistaken. I don't know, but that's you know that's one of the most iconic film soundtracks ever. Yeah, for sure. But it's it's um, and I think even uh, I I saw this interview with Jerry Goldsmith where he he talked about the first Omen score, which I believe he he got uh, an Oscar for that one, mm-hmm. but it was like. A super low budget movie, you know, and they hardly had a budget for for you know a proper soundtrack. And he was like, oh, "Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do it," you know, that <laughs> kind of thing. And it ended up being, you know, you know, uh, iconic. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, this this album is absolutely ex- exceptional. You know, it's like we. Thank you. That's very kind of you. It's, uh... It's amazing, honestly. Like I, I really do think it's the most ambitious thing you've ever done, and you can you can hear it. You can like, I don't know the. I think also it resonates for me personally. You know, I'm literally wearing a thing T-shirt. Like I love, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you know, and and I've I've really been getting into soundtracks in the last sort of like two years. So when mm-hmm. this came along, I was just like, wow, this is everything you would want. <laughs> Brilliant. No, but uh, but I think there there's a lot of overlap of of you know metal fans and you know soundtrack fans because it, at the heart of it you know it's a it really appeals to the same kind of bombastic large sounds yeah. you know it it, it 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 may be different instruments and everything but uh you know if, if you listen to prokofiev or something you know it's like it's like brah <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's something really really metal in there and then i've, I've been listening back to even uh, you know some early Judas Priest stuff. You know from Sad Wings and and uh, you know even you know from the Born Again album by Black Sabbath. And there's this dynamic flow. It's it's very cinematic, you know, in in the way it's built up. Mm-hmm. And uh, and um, I have been slightly n- not worried at all, but it's just like the realization with people's attention span in 2023. You know, and this this is a quite tall order for people's attention <laughs> to to kind of wrap their head around you know these dual layers of everything. But then again, I think it's such a uh, you know patience. You know, it's so 
sort of rewarding virtue <laughs> when 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 uh, approaching music because you, you can't really go straight to the crescendo you know you need to stay with the ebbs and flows all the way and then the payoff comes you know you, you don't skip the movie to to the to the final battle you know you you watch it from the, <laughs> you watch it from the beginning you know yeah. and um, it it takes you know it takes some dedication to to kind of wrap wrap your head around it i guess but but hopefully uh, just again as a fan uh, i i made this uh, this kind of image of how i wanted it to be it's like i want the album to be like a big hopefully impressive building when you first see it mm-hmm. you know or experience it and then you might some some people like Fuck yeah, that's a big building. That's that's cool, you know. And then move along. But some of the people might want to go inside. Yeah. And then I I tr- try to make sure to decorate all the rooms inside too, not just <laughs> the outside. <laughs> oh, amazing, man! Thank you so much for for taking the time. And I'll uh, yeah. thank you so much for the support. No worries, no worries, Ishan. Take care. Till next time. See you later. Cheers.